Hi. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hey. Hey. How's everyone doing? Fine, fine. fine. You? Good. Good. Busy. I've been uh, quite busy, actually. Yeah, that's good. So, well, yeah. <laughs> so let's uh, jump right in. Good. Starting with the agenda. I already added a couple of items. Um, some stuff that I, that I did over the uh, past week, some uh, demos to to show, some topics to talk about. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have anything to to add uh, that you would like to discuss? Mm, not now. Uh, not just. Uh, I see JSON serialization. Could you explain what is a uh, JSON island? Yeah. So it's just a name. Could have could as well have been just value, but an island, it's it's like a bit of JSON embedded in the overall JSON document. So, but it's it's not part of the same structure. It's it's considered to be opaque data. So I called it like a data island. I don't know if the term is accurate, but uh, I thought it was, it sounded so cool. So I used <laughs> island. But if you think it's odd, I'm, I'm okay with changing it. <laughs> but today I've worked on an issue that was reported by a customer. And they, it turned out, so, so let me explain the issue just briefly. They've, they are testing ELSA 3. They're using it in their own environments and uh, with, with integrating with their own application. And they have activities that perform transformations. So they map JSON from one format to another or one shape to another shape. But they were complaining about serialization issues. So whenever a fault would occur in their workflow and they try to open the instance, it would fail to open because a serialization error occurred with, with uh, and this is to do with this refactoring here, which introduces a custom JSON converter that supports polymorphism. We'll talk about that in a second. So I started to look into this issue and it turned out they are using Newtonsoft J objects to serialize and deserialize or store dynamic data in the in the context of their own custom activity. So a custom activity can have custom data stored in a dictionary called custom property. So it's just a property back. Really, it's a dictionary of string object pairs. And they were storing a J object in that. So, but this custom converter that I mentioned, this uh, polymorphic object converter, was trying to serialize it, but J object isn't serializable to a certain extent. But then when you try to deserialize, it just it just fails with some exception. I don't recall which one exactly. So it, it it's not very suitable. So so then I made an update to specifically handle J object instances. And if I encounter if the converter encounters a J object, it will just stringify it and store that string in this island property that you discovered. Okay. And also the, the other way around, if it's going to be deserialized, it will see that it's a J object and then parse that JSON island into a J object instance. And the point of this custom polymorphic object converter is to be able to round trip objects to and from JSON. And, and maybe you're thinking, well, that's not very exciting. I mean, that's what we do on a daily basis, right? But this is about having object graphs that, for example, have properties of type object, which could contain arbitrary items or an object. Point is, if you serialize that, without any custom converters and then deserialize it. It will not deserialize it into the original .NET type, but it will deserialize it into a JSON objects or JSON elements. Mm -hmm. And which is not what 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 we want. We want to mm -hmm. be able to reconstruct the original object instance of the actual type. So you need to 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 also serialize the type information about the objects being serialized. So that's this uh, that's a one uh, part of the refactoring of JSON serialization, but the uh, reason I started this process is, is before this change, if you would in, uh, serialize a workflow instance that contains variables and activity inputs, and let's say they there's two, ref, two object references pointing to the same object and serialize it, then this object will be serialized twice, or how many number of references you would have, that number would the object will be serialized that number of times in the JSON output. So that could be very inefficient if you have a, a, you know, large DTOs and they are referenced multiple times. It could blow up your uh, JSON output significantly. So uh, this fixes that by using references. So 
if the JSON serialized encounter is the same object already being serialized or that was already serialized, instead of serializing it again, it will now output a reference ID like in Newtonsoft JSON. There it's uh, it's a simple option that you can enable. System text JSON, you can enable it as well. But in combination with the polymorphic converter, I had to do a, a bit of extra work. Yeah, so uh, it's it's a big refactoring, but uh, now it's it's quite nice uh, if I do say so myself. <laughs> and I'm particularly pleased with the ability to just be able to output arbitrary objects that are typed as object in in the workflow state, for example, and then it's deserialized. And plus the fact that it now renders the refs instead of the full object. So it's uh, yeah, it's pretty good, but. You know, there may be a few bugs. I encountered a few bugs uh, during past week discovered by uh, this user and uh, well, it, it's looking good now. Maybe we can take a quick look at, at an example. So here maybe we have some data. Uh, so this is the island thing that uh, that this, this customer encountered. So let me open it in a scratch file here. So what do we have here? We have IDs. So th these are object reference IDs so that Whenever this object would be referenced elsewhere, it would have ref to this this one. So that's why we now see IDs in workflow states only. It's not included with other um, objects like workflow definitions because there it's not necessary. And also for the designer, it's not very convenient to have this format. So it's that's another part of the refactoring where the implementation of serialization it's more focused. And instead of having one shared serialization op uh, options provider, There's there are now um, specialized abstractions. So there's a workflow state serializer, there's a payload serializer, there's a workflow definition serializer, so that it's also less confusing to understand which when to use what. Be because before this change, there were various methods on the serialization options provider that were kind of vague. Uh, so it, it's, it was always a little bit of a puzzle which one to use, and it's would, and more seriously that that's also more prone to error when you when you use uh, those methods, and maybe at some point you change because you run into some some serialization issue, and then if you then make a change, then you don't know what else you may be affecting. So, in anyways, that that's better. This also ties a little bit into automated tests. Uh, there's more test coverage now, which we'll take a look at later on as well. So here. Let's see. So here, here we see the the error that this 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 customer encountered, which is and I simulated by just return uh, throwing an error from from a JavaScript activity just to to see what happened with the serialization. But this is all looking good. And then, oh, this is not the right example. It seems. Oh, this is not the customer uh, scenario. This is a different test case. But uh, let's see if I can find it. So here, this is a JSON string that they are embedding in their own custom activity. So they have a workflow and then they have a custom activity that has an output called trans, which is short for transformation. So then, and, and that is of type J object. So whenever now the serializer encounters a J object, it will serialize that JSON string in this field and the type, which is J object. And then it's able to round trip as well. But but instead of just deserializing using this type as you would normally do using a system text JSON uh, JSON converter, here it it specifically looks for this type, and if it encounters this type, it will just do J object that parse, and then the parsing this string. So uh, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, everything I have to say about islands. Next topic: workflow context. This is not a new feature in Elsa three. It it was added some time ago, but it wasn't really finished, and there there was. For a brief moment, there was a sample application, but it wasn't really complete. So at some point, I removed that. And then a user in the community asked about, do we still have it in Elsa 3? And is there any documentation or something like that? Which there wasn't, so I created an issue. As I started uh, reconstructing the sample application, I encountered a couple of missing fun features of workflow context. So uh, I added those, and I would like to, to show you what it's about and how it works. And just, just to summarize, what is a workflow context in this context? Imagine you have a, uh, a workflow that deals with customers. So what would you normally do out of the box? You would probably have an activity that loads a customer by some identifier, which could be a correlation ID or some other value, doesn't matter. Maybe you perform some operations, so the workflow executes. Maybe you 
read some information from the customer or update some settings on the customer. Maybe the workflow goes to sleep. Maybe you have a timer. And then at some point you want to resume the workflow. And at that point, either, you know, you could store the, the, the user object or the customer object in workflow state or some other storage provider, which uh, at that point it would automatically be loaded. But maybe you don't want this stale object. Maybe you just want to have a fresh copy always from the database whenever the workflow executes or resumes. And that's where workflow context providers come in. It's like just provider that executes before your workflow executes. So it provides context to your workflow in the background or aim, uh, you know, like ambient values that's just available to your workflow without having to have workflow variables declared in your in your workflow definition. So a, a context provider is it's very it's a very simple API. If you implement one, you have just two methods to implement. One is to load your context, which could be any domain object you like. So it could be a customer, it could be a document, or whatever makes sense in your scenarios. And then it also provides a safe method. So if your workflow makes changes to your domain object, you don't have to manually persist in your database. That would be the responsibility of this context provider that you do have to implement, but it's automatically invoked by the, the runtime. That's the point. So what does that look like? Here, there's, uh, here I have an example implementation. It's a class that ultimately implements iWorkflow context provider, which is a very simple interface, as I mentioned, just you have a load async and a safe async and you get access to workflow execution context for you know in order to to know what customer you want to load how do you determine this one probably it's some information you associate with your workflow instance through a correlation id or maybe even through a custom property and that's the default and that looks looks like this actually so so here i have a, a, a sample context provider that loads customers from some customer store that i have here and then in the load async, what I do, I, I call get customer ID on workflow context, workflow execution context. But Elsa, of course, doesn't know anything about customers. So this is just an extension method in the same sample project. So it's an extension on workflow execution context that internally calls a new method called get workflow context parameter. And this is provided by the workflow context module. So to be clear, Workflow context is an add-on module that you can opt into, which you can enable. So it, it's not available if you don't enable it. When you inst when you use the workflow context module, then you get this extension method that internally looks like this. Yes. So so the the, the it just reuses the workflow context execution custom properties dictionary. So if I do if I dig into the get property, then what it's doing is it's just trying to get a value from the properties dictionary. So any activity or your custom modules and activities, they all have access to this property back and you can store application specific values. And the workflow context module takes advantage of that extensibility point. But anyway, let's let's get back to, to this get customer ID. So here it uses this get workflow context parameter just to explain what is a workflow context parameter. This will be your customer ID for example, or document ID or whatever ID. You don't have to use this. You could use correlation ID if, if you want to correlate your workflow against the customer ID. But if you don't, maybe your workflow is associated with more than one context provider, like maybe there's a customer provider and a order provider and a shipping provider. You can associate them with different parameters if you, if you want. So for now, just suffice it to say it returns the customer ID that we want to use in the context provider. Sorry, that's not the right one, this one. So here we get the customer ID and then we use this customer ID. If it's provided, we use it to get the customer from the database. And this is uh, invoked before your workflow executes. And then by default, it will, will not be executed again during each activity in your workflow, but you can have it executed if you want to by setting a property on your activity that is called something like load, or I don't know the exact name, but it has something to do with load. So you can configure to invoke your provider during each activity if you want to. But normally you, you, you don't want to do that and it would cause a lot of database calls potentially or API calls depending on what your uh, provider is invoking. 
So this will be invoked automatically before a workflow executes. Also when it's resumed, it will be invoked once. And the same goes for save async. So, so this will cause your customer to be loaded into the uh, into the workflows context, and then it's available to your workflow. So let's say we have a sample workflow here. It's called customer communications workflow. This is a programmatic workflow. Just for uh, the demo, I also have a version in the designer that we'll take another look at after this one. It's a very simple workflow. It's just basically every five seconds spams the, the customer with an email to try and get them to buy something. So the, the first one is simple message where the customers welcomed, then they are encouraged to get their credit card ready and they are stressed, you know, the system is trying to stress them into buying something and then really motivating them to, to buy this awesome new product. The workflow will work. I'm not sure the customer will actually uh, buy anything, but that's, uh, that's not our concern here. Our concern is how do we get this customer ID? So here, this is an activity called set workflow context parameter. In ELSA 2, that is called set workflow context. Uh, but here, it's, it's, there's a clear distinction between the parameter, that's the input for your workflow context, and the actual workflow context, which would be the customer object. And this, can, this value can come from anywhere. As I mentioned, it could be the correlation ID. Here, I'm just getting it from the workflow input. So when I'm invoking this workflow, I'm going to provide the customer ID as input to the workflow, and the input is called customer ID. And that basically is mapped into this parameter for this custom workflow context provider, which, by the way, is installed here. So you can imagine you can have, mul you can have multiple ones. So there could also be like an order workflow context provider and maybe a document context provider for, for different scenarios. Each of them will provide this ambient value to your workflow but you, you need to provide uh, it, so some parameters so that it, that it can use to get the data from the from whatever data source. So that's that's being uh, passed here. And it's just using the type name to associate this, this parameter with this provider internally in the dictionary of the workflow state. So once this is set, and then here we are waiting for five seconds, and then we're going to send an email. And this is the interesting part. So this subject here is uh, it's a lambda, so it has access to the activity or the expression execution context, which is which has access to the activity execution context, and of course the workflow execution context, which means we have access to the workflow context, and that's being used here. So here we're using another static method on the expression execution context that uses another static method provided by the workflow context module to get the, the workflow context that was loaded by the by the provider. So this gives you access to the actual customer object. And it's not loading it at this moment. It's already available. You're just grabbing that object instance out of the, the transient properties that is being used internally. So here, every workflow execution context has transient properties, which is in memory, so it's never persisted, and just getting it by provider type. So it, there's an internal mapping between your custom workflow context provider and the object that was loaded. Also it com combined with the parameter. So I didn't provide any parameter name. I just specified the provider name. But if you did want to have multiple inputs for your provider, you can use that as well. But that's not being used here. I'm not showing it. And anyway, okay, so here we have the customer. Here we are using it again. But as I mentioned, it's already in memory, so it's okay to invoke it multiple times. So this goes on for a, multi a couple of, well, four times. So it's it's the same thing. Just every five seconds, it's going to send another email. So it's a very silly workflow, but it, it demonstrates the um, workflow context. So let me show you that it works. I will run this one or this project. I will invoke it from... Postman. So this is the ID of the of that workflow we just looked at. When I hit send, it should start generating email messages. So I'm doing that now. And now we wait for five seconds. So we got one here. So as you can see, it's using the customer name. I didn't show actually the, the customer store, but it's an in-memory collection of customers. And every five seconds, a new email comes in. So what, what would you do without the workflow context provider? You would have to have another way to load in your customer. So it could be a custom activity. And then potentially you would have to, after each send email, you would have to do something like new load customer, for example. And then you would have to have it, have to have it here as well, et cetera. But as you can see, that would clutter your workflow a little bit more. So, and it's it's repetitive, but with this workflow context provider, you you can make it more dry. Does it make sense? Do you have any um, 
any questions or is there anything that is maybe a little bit too vague? No, no, that's great. It's, it's a good thing. All right. So now that we've taken a look at this uh, in, in, in the programmatic workflow, let's take a look at the at the designer. So first, let's clear this one out. Then let's open the, uh, I already created here. So here I use the designer to create the same workflow. So it's it starts with setting the workflow context parameter here, or actually it starts with context. So if the context feature is enabled, you'll get an extra tab here, and it shows you the available uh, context providers that you have. So right now I have just implemented one. If I were to create another one, which we could do just for fun, but let's say copy this one and call this one order. So here I created a, a new provider. Then we need to make sure it's registered in our application like this. And now when I restart the application, we have uh, we should should see the um, the extra provider here. So the point is you can enable the desired providers per word for definition. And in ELSA 2, you could only enable one and you would have to enter the the assembly qualified uh, type name of the provider. Here you can just use checkboxes. So let me refresh this one. And as you can see now, we also have order. And the, if we sele select the, uh, the both of them, then we can choose here which parameter to set for which provider. So here I'm just using customer, but we could also choose order. If I uncheck this one and then refresh this UI, there's only one, this one enabled. All right, so uh, what do we set here is the provider type. So we have a customer provider, optionally a param parameter, uh, parameter name, which we'll leave empty, and, <clears throat> and the parameter value, which is um, get customer ID. So this comes from the input. So I declared, well, I supposed to have one input called customer ID. Let me add it. So here we have um, input for this workflow definition, and then we should be able to invoke it using the execute API endpoint here. And then as the body, we, we have inputs, and then the, the name of the input we just declared, which is customer ID. All right, so when we send, it executes. And, and what will it, will it execute is the next step. So this executed by setting the parameter value to uh, the number two, that's customer ID two, wait for five seconds, and then sending the email. So here, um, and this is this is to use it in the designer, you use JavaScript and not C sharp like I did in the a programmatic workflow demo, but uh, this get customer, this function, is dynamically def, uh, declared to the system based on the name of your provider. So if your provider is named customer workflow context provider, it strips the last part, the you know, the workflow context provider is stripped. So that leaves you with customer and that name here is then used for this function name here. This can cause some conflicts if you also have variables called customer. So uh, you need to be aware of that. Maybe we need to offer some some prefix or some suffix, or maybe come up with a different naming convention, but we, we can tweak that as, as we uh, identify the uh, issues. But for now, that's how it works. And this will provide you with the, this prov provides you with a strongly typed intelligence. Well, not today then, but it, it should, should have shown you the, the customer object. So then it should also show you the, the available properties. Let me see if I can refresh if it works then. I know there's uh, one issue sometimes when you load the designer for the first time, then it tries to make some API call to get the type definitions, but that fails with an internal server error because <laughs> workflow definition is null. And then the entire designer breaks for the Monaco editor. So uh, it's an easy fix to do, but I, I haven't done it yet. All right, so so now we see the, um, the properties of the customer. So that's cool. All right, so uh, I did run the workflow and you can see here the emails uh, are being sent again, but this time from the workflow, uh, this, the, this, the workflow created in the designer, which also means we should be able to look at the instances. Uh, I did see some errors here, so maybe something got broken. Anyway, this screen is too small for me to, uh, to do some proper debugging, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do that later. So yeah, so that's workflow context. So it's, uh, it's there, it was uh, a must have, uh, for me to to be part of the release candidate roadmap. Speaking of widths, um, that currently looks like 
this. So this is the there's a new tab here in the ELSA three project board, and this is the this shows you all of the items that are associated with the RC milestone, which I created a couple of days ago. Cool. So we're getting very close. There's a few issues reported recently. RC milestone is set to May 31, and from the way it looks right now, especially if you look at this board, it's very close. Of course, there's a lot of work to be done for the documentation, but I suspect I can I can start this with this uh, coming weekend, and then work through the month of May. Yeah, we should we should be able to release to NuGet or at least an RC. Yeah, we're all waiting for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's uh, that is that is quite exciting. Yeah. So that was a brief note on the RC here. So done. Very cool fix. Uh, it's 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 small maybe, but it was a, a thorn in my eye. Uh, but it's fixed by uh, by Daxton. And let me show you what the issue. Well, I can't show you the issue anymore because it's fixed. But so now, originally, maybe you remember from previous uh, presentations, you see this tooltip. It now neatly uh, has is it it's not cut off anymore. And or before this fix, it was. It got cut off, which was very ugly. But now it's uh, it's nice, so I'm very happy with that. So that's this one. Oh, actually, maybe we can see it here still. No, I, I didn't even bother to create a screenshot. Never mind. Tests. There's um, there's some so there's additional tests being added, and I would also like to show you a cool helper method that helps you test drive workflows. So uh, let's see what that looks. For example. So for example, here we have two workflows to test certain scenarios just to make sure that certain constructs work. So with Elsa, you, you can have implicit joints. So let's say you have a bunch of write lines here and then they are part of a flowchart. So they are part of their activities collection. And then here we have connections between them. And the point here is, is that maybe I, I should show it visually. It's easier to talk about it like that. So here. So, so at some point, this kind of workflows didn't work in Elsa 3 because the flowchart wasn't built for that originally, but that's changed. And, uh, and this is now also captured in a test. So, so in order to make sure this remains working, you know, in case we make changes and we inadvertently break something, we want to capture that. So here we have a bunch of test cases. Here it's just implemented in code, but what we have here looks more or less like this, although this contains a few more activities, but it's it's about this joining between. So here we have a fork implicitly uh, created here and then an implicit join. So that's what this is modeled here. To, to run this workflow, it's now very easy. All you need to do is, actually, this is not a good example. So this is a workflow runner that, that was already available. So this is not what I want to show actually, but this one is. Um, especially because this includes potentially also timers, so this is this is very very convenient. So the first thing you want to do is whenever you run a workflow, is make sure that the activity descriptors and uh, <laughs> expression providers are registered with the system. When you start Elsa in an app, uh, ASP.NET Core application, this is done through a hosted service. But when you run a test, the hosted services are not executed, so you need to do it manually here. Then you import the workflow. So in this case. It's using theory and then one workflow at a time. So that, that's just these files here. So it's going to be loaded using this extension method, import workflow definition async, which returns you a parsed workflow definition. And then this method allows you to run the workflow until the end. And it even works when you have workflows that create bookmarks that would cause your workflow to be suspended. But what this method here does, it will then look at those bookmarks and resume them so that it runs the workflow until the end. And then you can test whatever you want. So this <laughs> test case is about a bug where the workflow state would not enter the, the finished state, even though the, the workflow was done executing. So there was this bug in the flowchart activity, and this this captures uh, covers that uh, case, and it's now fixed. How could it resume bookmarks? Um, how does it know what, what values are resumed turned from these activities? Yeah, very good question because some bookmarks, in order for them to be resumed, they require additional data. So for those cases, in the, the way it's right now, that will fail. 
but okay. this these cases only um, handle uh, delay activity. So, for example, we have here an activity that uses delay activities and they create bookmarks, but those bookmarks don't require any additional input. So in those cases, it can just blindly resume them. And that looks like this. So here we start the workflow using some word for definition ID, mm -hmm. and then the result will include any bookmarks that were created. So that we have here, and then we, we turn those bookmarks into a stack, which we then loop over up one of one uh, bookmark at a time, and then we resume them here. But to your point, we are not including any additional any inputs. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But as you can see here, so, so, well, some bookmarks require this input, and if you don't provide it, then the the system will fail. Yes. Um, so this this will potentially be extended with where we allow you to provide some callback delegate mm -hmm. that gets invoked mm -hmm. so that you're particularly the test case can then take a look at these uh, bookmarks and provide the necessary input. So yeah. But cool feature to yeah. run the test. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think it's very helpful because many, many bugs occur so, in certain scenarios in certain constructs of workflows. And, and as we fix them, it's good to to capture them in this way. Is it is it within a separate new package, else testing, or where do we do find that? That's right. Uh, if we look at SRC, common, so there's a package called ELSA testing shared, and this okay. has a bunch of useful stuff. So here there's service provider extensions. And so here we see the populate registries, I think, and it's just extensions off of the service provider. So you don't mm -hmm. have to first instantiate or resolve the services. It's just some, this this model, some high level functionality that you can invoke here, import work for definition. Maybe some of these functions do too much. You know, they're very opinionated in the current form, but we can break them down as, as the need arises. Okay, cool. Installed features. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so as part of the workflow context, uh, as I mentioned in the, at the beginning, it's an optional feature, but it also, you know, in order to provide this list here that we see here, the list of providers, it requires an API call, which means it requires an endpoint to be made available. But if you did not enable this feature, those endpoints will not be available. Designer needs to know one way or another whether this feature is available. Otherwise, it would blindly try and invoke this API. It would not exist because it wasn't enabled. And then you would get client-side errors or API call errors, which, which isn't very clean. So in order to, to solve that, Elsa server now exposes an API endpoint that lists all of the enabled features. And that looks like this here. It is. So list features. And it's just, uh, of course, it's a simple array with feature descriptors and it doesn't contain very descriptive information at this point, but it could be extensible in the future. Maybe with when we build more tooling, if maybe then it becomes useful. But for now, the only thing the designer needs is the name of the feature. So then you can imagine there's a workflow context plugin in the, in the stencil application, and it specifically looks to see if the workflow context feature is part of this list or not. So when the designer application starts, it makes a few API calls to get the descriptors. So like what activities are available, what are the variable types and storage drivers, and it gets a list of installed features. Mm -hmm. Then here we see workflow context feature. So if this one is not returned, then you will the plugin will not do anything. It will not initialize the UI here with this context tab. None of this will be available. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so and this this is also going to be useful for other plugins and modules that we're going to build, like secrets management and and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. So that's installed features. Welcome to RC. We talked about yeah. So getting getting very close to the RC candidate or the mm -hmm. release candidate. Uh, workflow context is new. Let's see what else. Will it still be possible to add activities on, at run, uh, on runtime? So some new activity definitions at runtime. So in, in ELSA uh, version 2, it wasn't possible. So maybe it will be possible in ELSA 3? Yeah, yeah, it should be uh, possible in ELSA 3. So in ELSA 3, we have a thing called activity registry. No, let's see. There's a service that 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 is, represents a registry of of registered activities, but that can be updated at runtime. So the way that okay. works is <clears throat> what we have here. So here we have the registry. So it's an activity registry, mm -hmm. and um, 
So it has add functions. So this function allows you to add a descriptor associated with the with the provider that provided this thing. So mm -hmm. an activity is always associated with a provider, which is convenient because let's say you have this source from which you want to provide activities to the system. Let's say this source gets updated, then you want to refresh, but now you can refresh it just for your provider so that all of the other provided activities from other providers will not have to be re-queried, if you will, so that it's it's like an optimization, really. Yeah. Um, and also deletion is, is possible at runtime to delete, you know, only adding. Yeah, well, there's, the, well, there's a, uh, you can add all of the, activities associated with providers using clear provider but if yeah. there's a scenario where you need to delete just one activity for whatever reason we can of course add it but uh, i didn't find a use case for it so i didn't add it yet but yeah. we can always uh, add it later if, if necessary right now it's not using any caching either so mm -hmm. so but but this activity registry is a singleton so it's it's yeah. it's already cast if you will so so it's also easy to um, you know to just refresh your a set of activities when your uh, source provider requires to. Do you have That's any really um, any uh, activity provider in mind that you're going to build? Uh, we're building a system where we um, we're spreading the activities over multiple microservices. Each of these microservices are uh, providing some activities. For example, uh, getting orders from Amazon, getting orders from uh, web shop systems, and so on. And every time a uh, microservice is coming up, maybe a new one, um, he's um, publishing or he's sending his activities he is providing to, to the workflow engine, Elsa, and is saying, hey, I, I've got some new activities and I want to re register them. And the workflow uh, engine has to show that in the UI, someone configures a workflow and um, the workflow is being executed maybe by an HTTP request asynchronously um, as the, the, the activity is being executed um, is um, paused and asynchronously a, the, the request is, is being sent to the microservice, uh, the activity is uh, being executed and uh, this response is being sent back to the workflow engine asynchronously and is resuming the activity. So possibly, possible it could be on any time a new microservice is coming up and then some new activities and I don't want to restart the workflow engine every time when a new activity is coming up from, <laughs> from these microservices. So that would be cool if, if it could be added on runtime and that's, that's a cool feature here. What wasn't possible in um, as a version two. I'm thinking if it wasn't, I, I know it it was cast there, but do do you remember or do you know actually what was preventing this from 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 being able to do in in Elsa two? Um, I, I don't know. Maybe we registered the activities before the uh, the uh, build uh, method in in ASP.NET. I haven't tested it. Uh, maybe if it's possible to add it later. Um, but but uh, we we registered in in the startup method of uh, Elsa version two uh, on startup of the project. Yeah, gotcha. So. I uh, I think somebody else asked this question later, and I had to look it up because I wasn't sure if it was possible. I think I remember realizing that it, it should be possible in Elsa 2. I haven't tried it, so I could be wrong. A similar setup exists there where you also have a activity registry also based by um, providers, but there's a, a caching layer at play there. So if, you, if your activity type provider requires to be refreshed, you have to just trigger some some cache key okay. and then it will reevaluate all of the activity type providers. Oh, okay. So here we have type based activity. So this is just one of the providers. Yeah. And then so it's similar in in the construction. Yeah, okay. So here we get all of the activity types for each provider and mm -hmm. then that's being used. So here we're building a dictionary of it, but as you can see it's it's stored in a memory cache. Okay. But it's and and it, we're monitoring some some token using some cache key. So using this cache key, which is a public constant, you should be able to. Whenever you need to refresh your uh, thing, all you would have to do is trigger this cache key, and then all of the providers, including yours, that gets the information from your from your microservices, mm -hmm. would be 
re-evaluated. So it should mm -hmm. be possible. It would be. Uh, okay, cool. So I have to try it. Yeah. So, so typically, we we can load a new library DLL to load a new a new activity uh, at runtime. Seems so, yeah. But um, we don't have any uh, any uh, any method to unload uh, the, the library. Right. Yeah. So this this is this has to do with dynamically loading DLLs into your app, app, application domain. But uh, I, I if if I'm not wrong. In, when ASP.NET Core was first launched, it did it, it didn't have support for dynamically loading assemblies or very poor loading. I could be wrong, but this is what I remember. But at some point, they they added really good uh, support for being able to load assemblies at runtime and including unloading them. I haven't tried it, so maybe I'm uh, I'm mistaken, but uh, I think there's there's good support for that now. And in fact, I. I want it's something I want to do for Elsa too. Uh, not Elsa too, but I want to use it for Elsa as well to be able to have a NuGet packet somewhere or some DLLs maybe even that you can just point to and then load it in memory or into your application at runtime and and basically have modules dynamically installed into your system without having to redeploy. Whether that's a good idea for your case uh, that you know that depends on a case by case basis because it's also a little bit as as if you are adding code in production at runtime, which mm -hmm. is probably not a good idea. But it's, it, I think at least it should be an option for maybe those use cases where you do want to be able to do so. Yeah, and uh, as I understand, in .NET Core, there is not the same notion as uh, app domain, and but there is different uh, library and frameworks that allow us to create a, a plugin architecture, be able to load uh, and unload specific library, and then. Uh, uh, let the garbage collecting everything uh, when uh, the, the library uh, are not used. Uh, but I think this just uh, asks us to to define a correct uh, interface uh, between the, the uh, in the plugin architecture. Yeah, that that does ring a bell. Okay. So something along those lines uh, you, you want to add. <laughs> All right. So just a few final words on the roadmap that just came to mind is of course what comes next after um, the release candidate. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, oh, it's not here. Let me. So I want to focus on multi-tenancy. Oh, great. That's cool. And get, yeah, it's, it's, it's a long asked for feature and I, mm -hmm. I never took the time to, to just dig into it, but, um, but I really want to, because it's going to enable a lot of cool use cases. For hosting at least but one thing i'm wondering is is about this library there was one library that was fin buckle come again fin buckle maybe fin yeah. buckle yeah it yeah, was you yeah. was that you who, who uh, no 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 that? but we discussed it a few, a few weeks uh, before and we also digged in a little bit in fin buckle and it's a cool library and we maybe we we will use it in our uh, software too nice yeah so my only hesitation with using this library is it depends on on how deeply it has to integrate with it, with elsa core right so i don't want elsa workflow core to be to have a dependency on 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 something like that if i can help it because it's you know it then everyone would automatically have to inherit that dependency it's like maybe it's a little bit like you know depending on something like auto mapper which yeah. would have which what i've seen in elsa 2 causes a lot of pain for many users that are using for example uh, abp which also uses auto map auto mapper so uh, yeah, it requires some investigation, some research on on what how to best tackle this one. But I I do hope I will be able to to use that library because it looks it looks a real, like they did a really good job there, mm -hmm. and I would hate to have to repeat what they did. Yeah. So we'll see. So that's yeah. that's on my wish list. Um, and another one is BPMN two, <laughs> which is one of the first questions I was asked when I released Elsa one was what about BPMN. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that sounds cool. Let's uh, let's see. But I never got gotten around to uh, to digging into it. I did um, think a couple months back, look at Komunda and uh, and and delved a little bit into BPM and two specification. And um, yeah, it looks really doable with the Elsa three engine, where 
you can now have actually uh, just a BPMN activity that then internally interprets BPM annotation, of course, and then it has to implement uh, the protocol to 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 schedule the uh, the activities and and stuff like that you can start with a small package uh, of bpmn and you don't have to support all the bpmn features uh, for the first time so all the a basic bpmn support would be great yeah yeah that's a good point so we can do it in in multiple iterations and we start yes, simple yes. and then build on that yeah um those milestones I actually created them just to be clear i i don't necessarily commit to those dates it's the best effort as so it's, it's always the case with these sort of projects but it's good to have to try and set a goal at least here there is the milestones so first rc may 31 then one month later or actually this is uh, this is one month later mm. if there's no serious issues then i think we can release the 3.0 official release on nuget so this will be nuget this will be nuget and this yeah could be it's it's still open ended. What will be included? Hopefully, multi tenancy at least. But uh, okay, we will LSA see. three with multi tenancy and as a three point point one with BPMN support in <laughs> July the thirty. <laughs> Great, <laughs> nice try. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. I'm not tired enough to <laughs> fall for that, but uh, I appreciate yeah. the attempt. Yeah, no. Yeah. So it's uh, let me correct you. It's got to be multi tenancy. Hopefully for three point one and then. BPMN, it's it's possible, but I, I it's hard to tell at this point how complicated it will be because I also want to include a designer. You know, there's just a reusable BPMN designer library that's out there, but it's going to require some work to get it integrated currently in Stencil. Uh, speaking of Stencil, another big thing on my wish list is to replace the Stencil implementation with a Blazor implementation for the designer, but also to have a, a modular extensible application dashboard built with Blazor. But uh, so those are three big items to uh, to work on uh, post ELSA 3 release. Sounds really good. Looking forward to for it. Thank you. Yeah, same here. Um, yeah, that's all I got. If you guys have anything else, let me know. Otherwise, I'll catch mm -hmm. you later. Yeah, thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Yeah. See you Take, next week. Have a good one. Take care. Bye. 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 See you next week. <laughs>